recently that a colonel came round seeking volunteers to go to Japan as part of a British Commonwealth force. There was only to be 9,000 men and women, uh, all from uh, all over England and Gurkhas from, from India. And we immediately volunteered and within uh, quite a oh, couple of weeks, I think, we were on board a ship called the Arundel Castle, another smaller cruise ship, um, which had been converted again to a troop ship. And we sailed for Kure in Japan. <coughs> um, didn't do so well on solo, uh, just about broke even, but uh, couldn't complain. And um, from Kure, we were taken to Shikoku. You remember Shikoku? There were, I think, four islands or five, is it? Four. Four main islands. Four main islands. Well, Shikoku is sort of in the middle, isn't middle it? Is yeah. And we were taken there by truck, uh, and we occupied a, a barracks, which had been a Japanese naval barracks. But before leaving, they had uh, carried out what was known as, um, um, uh, oh dear, what's it called? Scorched earth policy. This is something that the, the Russians did uh, when the Germans were advancing. And it's, it simply means that they destroyed everything that could be useful to the enemy and that they couldn't be taken away. And they, the Japanese had done this, so there was virtually nothing for us to take over, apart from the building. Now, no unit, however small or large, can, can function without an administration. And so our priority was to get some office furniture, some desks and some machines. And um, we formed, I think it was four units, four teams, uh, with a three-ton truck, and three or four men and a shopping list and we went out to do our shopping and I was with a team that went about 50 miles away to a large electronics factory. Um, a very elderly watchman um, opened the gates, lots of battles, I think he was cursing us but he was saying lots of things to us and he let us in and we, we went through our shopping list, got everything we needed plus a few extras First, my first experience of buy one, get one free. And uh, we, we took everything we needed, and um, when it's time to leave, uh, he indicated he had a large ledger, and we had to sign it. Not quite sure what the purpose was, but it just simply gave the date and the items and your unit, and they wanted a signature. And uh, put this in front of me. Uh, I noticed that Judy Garland had been in and taken some equipment a few days before, <laughs> and a little while earlier, Attila the Hun had been in. <laughs> and I was in a, a rather frivolous mood, so I signed Mucky de Sard, and, and took what we needed, and he thanked us very much, sayonara, and we went back to our unit. <coughs> and um, we, were, we were, as I say, only 9,000 men and women, the main occupation force, of course, were, were the Americans, and under General MacArthur, he was a supreme commander. And he had um, decreed that all Japanese, to make sure they realized they had lost the war, between the ages, I think it was a 14 and 65 or something, had to do three days unpaid work a week for the, for the occupying forces. And this was quite a problem because to find legitimate work for so many, there were so many of them, um, was, was proving a problem that we were fortunate in that our commanding officer had been a mining, uh, 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 what would you call him? He wasn't a miner, he was a, a mining consultant, if you like, uh, in civil life. And he had the brilliant idea of getting the Japanese to dig holes in the surrounding fields. Uh, and then when you could barely see them, and bear in mind, they're quite small when they went down, uh, they would be brought up and fill in the holes and start digging other holes, and that's how we kept them occupied for three days a week. Very ingenious, mm. and it worked. Mm. And uh, life was rather boring there. Um, I started a correspondence course in accountancy, but after two or three exchange of letters, I decided it wasn't for me. Uh, I did learn to drive when you had to double dig clutch, and you started by swinging a starting handle, not turning in an ignition key, and there were no indicators. When you wanted to indicate, you had to use your hands. So that was real driving in those days. And um, uh, as I say, it was rather boring. Um, I did manage to have a seven-day leave in Tokyo, which was lovely. Um, 
I was allocated a, a um, North Korean uh, undergraduate, a girl called Ku. I've got a picture of her somewhere. She took me to all the places of interest. So we went to the presidential palace, the presidential gardens. Um, the Far East war crimes trial was the equivalent of Nuremberg, but in the Far East. And there was a card there which shows you all the defendants and so on. And um, also we saw the tribute of the colour in honour of the Queen's birthday. A merchant seaman some years before who said that if ever you have the opportunity to have your appendix removed, have it done because it went, if you ever do need to have it done, it was obsolete, it didn't do anything, uh, it would probably happen at the most inconvenient time. And I thought, well, this is a good opportunity, I've got some time to spare. <laughs> so I, I, ch I read up the, uh, the symptoms of a, a, uh, an appendicitis <laughs> and a very reluctant medical officer referred me to a very even more reluctant surgeon and um, I was admitted and he agreed to do it and uh, he took the appendix out and uh, this is rather funny the the night after the operation I wasn't sleeping too well and the sister came round and said would you like a cup of tea and I said yes please um, and she brought it and then she started and I was still semi-conscious of the operation obviously I'd had a general anaesthetic she started talking about she'd lost a pickle uh, a lost a gherkin I thought, how can you lose a gherkin? And how important is that in the order of things? Now I realised she was saying she'd lost a gurkha because they had their own ward in the hospital. And uh, she said, they all look alike. Mm. I've heard that before. Um, so uh, what should I do? I said, well, get in touch with the intelligence corps and they, they'll take it over. And she did. And this fellow was found wandering in the country three or four days later. He'd had a bit of a mental problem and they found him. But the morning after the operation, the surgeon came round and he said it was the healthiest appendix he had ever taken out <laughs> and offered it to me in a jar. And I said, thank you, but no thank you. We had the opportunity to visit Hiroshima, uh, which we all, all took, obviously. Um, <clears throat> the scenes were devastating. As far as the eye could see, uh, there was total destruction. Uh, I've got photographs there that I took. <clears throat> Tremendous loss of life. Um, both on the day and for months afterwards. Um, and it caused a lot of illness. Um, but uh, there are a couple of artifacts here that I picked up off the ground, <coughs> which were undoubtedly highly radioactive at the time, but nobody warned us. The Americans had been warned because they had to throw overboard any, any visiting ships. The, where the, uh, the sailors had picked up stuff, they had to be thrown overboard into the sea, but we weren't told and we were allowed to keep these. Um, I can't let you handle them because they're getting rather fragile and also the fact that I cut myself on them last time I showed them. But this one here is a small bottle um, which had sort of half melted in the tremendous heat and these, believe it or not, were small sheets of glass which were welded together. I'm not quite sure what the purpose of those was but um, they were certainly radioactive, never affecting me, so my wife says. Uh, but I did have to take them to the National Physical Laboratory because at that time one of my grandsons wanted to take them to Sinai School and the headmistress wouldn't let him. Um, so she insisted that I took them to the physical laboratory. <coughs> they carried out the series of tests and I've got a, a clearance certificate there. When we were in Hiroshima, people were still walking around with these terrible radiation burns. And um, the problem was there was no known cure because uh, the atom bomb had never, atoms had never been used before in this way. Uh, and so some of the treatments that were being applied were quite bizarre. I mean, we heard of people having um, uh, mashed potatoes put on their wounds, which probably didn't do any good, but probably caused a lot of infection. Uh, but it was ghastly. And, um, and so I'm sometimes asked whether I, I feel that the Americans were justified in dropping the atom bomb. Uh, and my answer is yes, I think they were because some American experts had calculated that had we been required to invade the Japanese mainland, uh, there would have been one and a half million casualties. Fatalities, not casualties, one and a half million casualties. The numbers killed, although they were terribly high, and those that died afterwards, were nothing approaching that figure. So in that sense, I think it probably was justified. Other people, of course, argue that it wasn't necessary, that, J that Japan was about to, to surrender anyway. 
but that's something we shall never know. <coughs> and then um, <coughs> eventually Group 51 came up. We boarded a ship um, which was ghastly and uh, a near riot took place. I've got press reports here of some men in the Devonshire Regiment. There was um, there were lice in the blanket, there was food in the, there were insects in the food, it was overcrowded, it was ghastly. And uh, some of them were um, arrested under the Riot Act and put in the ship's prison for um, uh, court-martial. <coughs> because of this we weren't allowed to land in Hong Kong on the way back, which we had been promised. Uh, and we landed in Singapore and were taken uh, to a place in Malaya called Kluang. It was a real dump. There was no running water. We had to be supplied by water tanker. No electricity. We had generators. Um, and I don't know why they sent us there unless it was to sort of toughen us up after the cushy time we'd had in, in, in Japan. <coughs> um, we weren't there very long. And then uh, I was sent home on uh, uh, the ship, as I say, went to order shot uh, for, to be discharged, handed in my uniform and was given a civilian suit and bits and pieces, a railway ticket, um, and that was the end of my career after four and a half years. So I felt I was very fortunate. I hadn't been injured. The only uh, illness I'd had was this uh, vaccine fever. Um, and uh, I had come out in, in one piece. Uh, there was no good war, there is no such thing. I know sort of parts of the world that I probably would never have seen otherwise. And that's it.